going to open up our Bibles to Luke chapter 4 this morning. And uh, for, for we have a lot of visitors and guests here today, so really glad to see that uh, many of you got to come out on this holiday uh, during this time. A lot of our church members are also away traveling uh, this particular week uh, on all various locations throughout Korea and abroad as they are also celebrating this holiday. Um, and we're continuing a series, not really a series, a book study of the book of Luke. Now, uh, one of the reasons that I particularly chose Luke was because I feel like this is a very good introduction into the teachings of Jesus, that this is something that can begin to capture our hearts, can uh, begin to intrigue our minds, uh, that there's all different areas and things that we can glean from the book of Luke that we ourselves would know that we know who Jesus is, right? The emphasis of Luke is that we would know that we know who Jesus is. And as we started and as we began to move forward, we're seeing the move of God. We're seeing angels. We're seeing a miraculous birth. And then we just last week, we had the baptism of Jesus in which the heavens opened up. God's audible voice spoke. And how long had it been since God's audible voice had spoken in Israel in which he declared upon Jesus, this is my son. This is my son in whom I love. And the Holy Spirit came and descended upon him like a dove. And he got filled with the Spirit of God. And it is all about this whole picture and this idea, what kind of king do we have? What kind of kingdom is God's kingdom going to be? And that's a very legitimate question that we needed to end up having and answering. And so Jesus, like the, uh, the, the fathers of the, in the Old Testament, is going to go on a journey. And he's going to go on a journey. And in this journey, we're going to begin to ask ourselves a question. Will Jesus be like the way that the ancestors were? Will he be like Moses or will he be like Joshua? Is it going to be like King Saul or will he be like a King David? What kind of king do we, are we going to end up having? What kind of Messiah are we going to end up having? And so if you can just imagine that the excitement, like they knew who John the Baptist was. They knew that here is this new kind of prophet that hasn't arisen in Israel for quite some time. Uh, an angel foretold his birth. He was a, he was a zealot. He was incredibly uh, disciplined. He was very righteous. People would Ato. come. Oh. Ato. 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 Yes, Jesus? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm like, mine's on silent, really. <laughs> so, uh, so we, we, okay, rewind. <laughs> I was getting my preach going. I could feel it. And it's like, okay, simmer down. All right. Um, so if we begin to think about, like, all these people had come out to Jerusalem They'd come out to this place. They'd come out to the area where Joshua had entered the promised land. They came out to the area where Elijah sent his mantle upon Elisha. They came out to the area where God had demonstrated his power to Israel with the collapse and the fall of Jericho. As now we have the nation which is living within the promise. And they were expecting a king. They were wanting a king. They were hoping that, you know, it was so close to those autumn festivals in which the appearance of the Messiah as king is supposed to take place, that they were hoping now is the time that we're going to have a new David who just like went and defeated Goliath and the Philistines, that Jesus would become this military general king, warrior prince, come in and just take out Rome. And finally, Israel would be ushered into its golden age and golden era. This was the hunger and the desire. And as soon as God's uh, ordination of Jesus happened, what's the first thing Jesus did? Well, it says right here. Chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, 
being tempted by the devil. And so as we end up having, it's like, is this the natural journey of a king? And I don't know about you, but for myself, you know, my walk with Jesus is not a natural walk that the world would ever look at and say, that's something that I think we should like all get our kids to go do. Like our walk with Jesus is anything but normal. Our walk with Jesus is contrary to the world because all of the sudden when we get called by God, when we get filled with the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden the things of the world begin to lose its hold. It begins to lose its luster. Maybe our desires began to change. Our focuses began to change. Our motivations began to change. All of a sudden some friends that we, that we were so close with, all of a sudden they weren't so close with, and then people who we were never close with, all of a sudden we discover we have a heart connection with. And, and then we start to think about other people and, and we start to think about our actions and in it eternal aspect of, of, of what God has called for us. You know, for myself, I, I went to, un- I was the first person in my family to go to university. I had a call of God upon my life from a very young age, but I went to university. Um, I was actually thinking like I would become a lawyer or a judge, a politician. I thought this was the area that God would probably use me, and I would be really happy just being kind of like in a local church and, you know, maybe just like, you know, the youth pastor part-time. of us. I like small churches and things like that. And I thought, oh, that would be really great. That's what I wanted to do. And my parents, my, my parents were so excited because I'm the first one to graduate from university, and I worked three jobs to put myself through college. I didn't have uh, support. I, you know, worked hard. I studied hard. I graduated, like, second highest in my class. And my, my, my um, uh, department head the dean of my college, she called me into her office, and she began to beg me to go to law school. And she's like, we need your mind in law. I can get you into any law school in this country. And I said, yes, but God is now calling me into ministry. No, you cannot go into ministry. You must go into law. She was, you know, if, so if I had been Korean, I would have just gone, oh, yeah. And, you know, like, okay, I guess I need to change my whole plan. But God had filled me up to overflowing in university. I had begun to experience things of the Holy Spirit that I had never experienced before. I was getting a confirmation that the call that he gave to me when I was 10 years old to go into uh, ministry, that it was not simply about remaining in a local small church, but there was something greater that he had for me. And so you can imagine how thrilled my father was to discover that I decided to become a faith-based missionary in which I had to, like, ask people for my support as I began to do the training and then be sent off into missions, and I went to Eastern Europe. Isn't that great? I was going to be the millionaire for the family. I'll never forget my grandmother, you know, you're going to be the millionaire. And my parents, you're the one who will take care of the whole family. I was going to be the hope for the family. And instead of going to law school, instead of going to get the six-figure job, I became the faith-based missionary, and I was receiving like less than $10,000 a year to live. And 20 years later, well, not quite 20 years later, I'd say... When was it? It was 2000. Oh, gosh. Time flies. It was like 10 years ago. There was a very uh, large Messianic congregation, at least, and uh, their rabbi was retiring, and they actually sent out notices, you know, to try and fill the position. And it was going to pay really well. Like, and it was a really, like, 200-member congregation. I was perfect for this job. And I just was curious what my parents were thinking and feeling at that time. And so I actually called my dad separately from my mother. Because, you know, if you talk to dad and mom together, then whatever mom says, dad agrees. So I thought, I'm going to talk to dad first. And I want to find out from dad what he's thinking. So I call up my father and say, father... There's this amazing opportunity. You know how you've wanted me to settle down and and you want me to have like a regular income. And what do you think? Should I apply for this position? 
And my father said, do you really want to stop what you're doing to just go back to a local congregation for security? I was stunned because my father isn't an overly spiritual man. He's, you know, he, he's just very stoic. He's very quiet. Uh, he, you know, he doesn't talk much at all and these kinds of things. And, but when he does speak, it has such weight. And then, of course, I called my mother, and then my mother was like, do you really want to stop what you're doing? And I thought, this is God's confirmation. This is God's confirmation. See, we don't always walk down the path that we think is the right path. So Israel was expecting Jesus to walk down a very specific path. He was thinking that he would be like a combination of Saul and David and this like warrior and a little bit of Joshua to come and like kick out the infidels and restore the kingdom. That he was going to finally come with the fire in his eyes and, you know, riding the white horse and that he was going to come with a sword, and he was going to rule the land. But instead, Jesus retreated from the spotlight and went into the desert. Now, the desert is a very important picture for us as believers. How many of you have ever felt like you're just like really spiritually dry? You ever feel that? Oh, look, look, that was really fast today. Wow, you guys had your coffee early this morning. It's like, yeah. It's like, oh, I remember talking to people, oh, I'm so dry, I'm just so dry. My, I'm in a spiritual desert right now. But that's not a correct picture of the desert. When you feel spiritually dry, it is not because you're in a desert. When you feel spiritually dry, it's because you're in the land of promise, but have taken your eyes off of God. See, you become spiritually dry when you cease to rely upon God for everything. When you start to think it was the work of your hands that brought your money. It was the work of your hands that brought your reputation. It's the work of your hands that did these things. Who needs God? I've got doctors. I've got credit cards. I've got a house. I don't need God. And that's when you become dry inside because you start to do everything by your own might. You don't realize how much the Spirit of God is working for you and with you in everything that you're doing. Because when you were in the desert, when Israel was in the desert, it's very simple. You believe and trust in God or you die. That's it. There were no other gods of the desert. A whole people group could not live in the desert. There wasn't enough to eat. There wasn't enough water. There wasn't enough of anything. And this is what gave Israel a reputation that for 40 years they lived and dwelled in the desert and they grew. And they grew. And they grew. And so the truth is that when you're in this dry place, I suggest go to a desert because then at least you put yourself in the position, now I will truly trust in God or I'm dead. This, was the less, this is the message God taught me on my first trip to Israel. I fell in love with the God of the desert and I began to go on a lifelong journey about 25, 26 years now and beginning to just kind of seeking the Lord. How Can I live in the land of promise without taking my eyes off of you? Because you don't want me to be a monk in the desert. You want me to be the shining example to the world around me. But when I'm surrounded by everything and every good thing comes so easily, I can so easily then take you, God, for granted. So Jesus himself takes this journey, this symbolic journey into the wilderness, into the desert. And for 40 days, he doesn't eat. And each day is like one of the 40 years that Israel was in the desert. Jesus is walking the path of his ancestors. Jesus, to be the Messiah, has to do what every single other prophet did, but to a greater degree. Degree. It is not good enough that Jesus was a prophet or was a teacher. He had to be greater than every other prophet. He had to be greater than every other teacher. He had to do more miracles. He couldn't just repeat an old miracle. He had to be better and do more than each of those miracles in order to be the Messiah. 
And so as Jesus then goes into the desert, many people believe that he went back to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. It takes about 11 days journey to go from the Jordan River to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. This is the same mountain that when Israel left Egypt and they came to the mountain of God, that God spoke to all of Israel the Ten Commandments. This is the very place where God called Israel into their destiny. This was the place that when Elijah had fasted for 40 days after he was running from Jezebel and he went to Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, and while he was on that mountain, then you had the earthquake and you had the wind and you had the fire, but God wasn't in those things. But it was in the still small voice that we have God. See, with Israel, when they first went to that mountain, God was in the fire. And God was in the earthquake. And God was in the wind. But then with Elijah, he did something different. He all of a sudden came, and now he was in the still, small voice. So with Jesus, we're going to see something different. What is Jesus' encounter in the wilderness? What will Jesus come up against when he goes on his journey? And when he was there, he was being tempted by the devil. Second half of verse 2. And he ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. How many of you relate to that? You know, like, I remember my first time fasting. Oh, and then, you know, that didn't last, you know. It, it lasted less than my normal fasting between breakfast and lunch. I don't know what it is. Like, when you start to try to do, like, fasting, all of a sudden it's like, normally I can go from, like, breakfast to lunch without a snack, but all of a sudden it was like, breakfast, oh, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, or, like, dinner, I'm so hungry. Now, one of the things, as a brief side, this has nothing to do with the message, um, Typically, because in Western culture we have this like 24-hour clock thing that people kind of do midnight to midnight fasting. And as a Jew, I never understood that. Like, it was like, you know, because you like eat dinner and then you're like kind of hungry and it's like, or you're going to gorge yourself just before you go to bed. But if you gorge yourself before you go to bed, you actually wake up hungry because your body's like coming with withdrawals from food. So that's not a very healthy way. Now, in the biblical mindset of a day, the new day begins at sunset. So what's really great is in the Jewish tradition of fasting, we eat a meal before sunset. And then we fast until the next sunset, and then we eat a meal again. So that way, it's not actually like, okay, I'm going to wait till midnight, and I have to wait till midnight to eat again. Like, that just messes up your body. But God actually created a rhythm that we could actually endure. So I would encourage you that if you struggle with fasting, to experiment with different ways of fasting for yourselves. Now, if you have an eating disorder or if you have medication or some kind of illness, then don't put any guilt or shame upon yourself for fasting. Fast something other than food. Food just became the, the, a standard way of depriving ourselves to refocus our life mind, and spirit upon God. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus fasted 40 days. He went just like Elijah went and many other people uh, throughout history had done. And he was walking in this thing. So he was hungry at the end of 40 days. And, you know, because he was a, a Jew and not a Korean, you know, there was no temptation for juke. Oh, juke for everybody else is a rice porridge that, like, samgye juke is my favorite. It's, you know, chicken juke. It's really, really nice, uh, especially after you've been fasting. I have to do that because, you know, people outside of Korea watch this, and then they're like, what's juke? And I'm like, oh. Now, if we come to this, he was hungry. Now, I don't know about you, but do you get hangry? I like, I like when that hangry, you know. So I, I have a friend, I have a friend the other day was like, how hungry are you? I'm like, I'm uh, like, put your hand out. And I put my hand out and it was like, it was like this. They're like, oh, you're getting hangry. Okay, we need to eat now. It's like, oh. And, and Satan purposely waited to this moment of moments in which Jesus was to that point of complete hunger, exhaustion. In the desert. And remember, this is August in the desert. 
Now, the location, there's two, there's a traditional location in, in southern Israel called Mount Sinai, archaeologically most likely not the place at all. The most likely place is in Saudi Arabia. Most people don't go to Saudi Arabia in the heart of August. So you need to realize that Jesus didn't just go to a wilderness. Jesus walked to one of the hottest places on earth during the hottest month on earth. And he went 40 days without eating. And Satan then decides to come and begin to tempt him. See, Satan, crafty Satan, he always knows when to strike. Why? It's not because he's all-powerful, and it's not because he's all-knowing. He's not. He's neither all-powerful or all-knowing. He's just really, really old. And he has a lot of experience. And he has a really good network. And so he knows when your weakest moment might be. And it comforts me to know that Jesus himself, right, this is not... This is Jesus who is 100% man at this point, right? He's not like some demigod who has some supernatural power of while he's fasting, he's still like running marathons and, you know, doing all these things. He would have been a man. He would have been lethargic. He would have been tired. You know, hopefully he was drinking enough so he's not too dehydrated. But he was a man. And that as a man, he was open to all of the temptations, all of the testings, all of these things. The idea of Jesus even being able to be tempted, it wasn't so that he would be like, you know, that these weren't real, genuine things that would have tugged on Jesus' heart. Because a temptation means you have the opportunity and free will to either choose to go in the way of God, or to choose to go in a different way. That's what a temptation is. That you have the choice to choose to sin. Or you'll have the choice to not sin and to reassure and go in the direction of God. And it comforts me to know that Jesus himself came to a point where he too could be tempted as a man. And Satan came to him and said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. So I was like, oh, is it because he's hungry? No, this is about his identity. Who are you? And this is, and it's interesting that this is even the first one that's mentioned because I think this is the greatest struggle that each and every single one of us have. Goes to the core heart. Who are we in God? Who does God say you are? Versus who does the world say you are? Who does the adversary say you are? Who does, who do you say that you are? If you're really the son of God, Can I get you to doubt your identity? Can I get you to doubt who you are? Can I get you to doubt the truth? Can I, Satan, put a new identity upon you? See, God just said, you, uh, this is my son. And what happens when we start to follow Jesus is as soon as we decide to step up and stand out, the immediate attack of the enemy comes to say, who do you think you are? Are you going to grab a hold of your old identity? Is he going to simply say, I'm the carpenter, I'm the stonemason's son from a nowhere nothing Galilee of a small village of refugees who is a fallen house and a broken house of a broken kingdom? That's the reality. Jesus came from poor village life. His family was the broken family of the line of kings of David. When they came back from Babylon, no one wanted this family line in Jerusalem. That's why they eventually settled in the Galilean hills in an area which there had been no settlements before. And they lived in the mountains, poor, in a poor community where it was hard for their own farming, where it was hard work, where they had to, and they had to work every single day. There was no glory of King David or King Solomon for him.
Are you the son of God? Are you the son of God? Are you the daughter of God? Are you the chosen of God? Are you the beloved of God? Are you the friend of God? And Jesus answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. See, he comes back with, a, with more scripture. And he begins to, to use this, this strength of Deuteronomy. Now, just to give you an idea of the power of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was the last book that was written by Moses. And, and he spoke, he actually sang, he sang this book over Israel. And can you imagine, it was recapping the fullness of the miracles of God, all the things that God had done for Israel, that they were foolish when they had come out of Egypt. And when they had come to this mountain, they made the golden calf, and they wanted a God that they could see and a God that they could touch. They were complaining about, like, oh, in Egypt we had our leeks and our garlic, and out here we just have our manna. And it was the place where then they, you know, they, they were unfaithful to God again, and again, but then God loved them again and again. God saved them again and again. And Jesus is using the words of Moses as a descendant who came from the promised land, who came from the faithfulness of God, that he was reminding his own spirit, rise up my spirit. Remember the story of God. Remember the, 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 the miracles of God. Remember the promises of God. And that's what you need to do, that as you are being tempted, as as your identity is being questioned, you need to remember your testimony. You need to remember the testimony of God. You need to remember the story of the Bible, of your ancestors, of your lives. How did you come into this loving relationship of a king who is coming again? You need to remind yourself and that you use the power of the word of God to come against the accuser of the brethren. And then the devil took him. And showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And said to him, to you I will give all authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me. And I give it to whom I will. See, Satan, Satan was really, he wasn't sure who this Jesus guy was. You have to understand this. Like, Satan didn't know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He's not all-knowing. See, if he knew this was that Messiah, if he knew that this is the author and the finisher, that this is the one who's literally the, pro the very first prophecy to Eve in the garden, right? The serpent's going to bite your offspring's heel, but he's going to crush the head of the serpent. If Satan knew that was this, Satan would have done something very different with Jesus. He would have maybe tried to throw him off the mountain. He wanted Jesus to sin. See, because when everybody sins, you give your authority to Satan. When you sin, you, you, you take the authority that God has given you, and you then relinquish some of that to Satan. And every single person, usually by the time we're a baby, we've sinned, and we begin to sin. But Jesus never sinned. And you can imagine that all of a the sudden there becomes this ripple through the kingdom of Satan. There is one person who we haven't been able to get to sin. We've like, we've bullied him and we've ridiculed him. We, we've, you know, you can imagine that the, the local principalities and, and the demons, like the, the ones that so much so that it went up the chain to where Lucifer himself, the fallen angel of God himself, is getting involved because he's a limited being. He can't be everywhere. And he's taking a moment because he's like, this is one man who hasn't given me his authority. And so he comes with a lie, a seductive lie. And it's the same lie that he gave to Abraham. It's the same lie that he gave to Jacob. It's the same lie that he gave to David. He took a destiny and a purpose and he rushed it. Now, Abraham rushed it, and you know, with his own wife and the promise of an heir. Joshua, Joseph, sorry, Jays. Joseph, 
right? He, he rushed his dreams and his prophetic dreams where he made his family hate him. And again, Satan sensing there's something different about this one. Now, he knows about the line of David, so maybe he's, and there's been lots of rebellions in Israel already, so he's like, hey, maybe he wants to be king. Maybe he, he really wants to be king, and not just king of Israel. Maybe he wants to be like Caesar and be the ruler of the world. And that's exactly Jesus' destiny. Jesus' destiny is to be the king and the ruler of the world. And Satan, in his lies, because that's what he is, he's father of lies, is trying to rush Jesus' destiny. How many times in your own life have you gone ahead of God because Satan put a temptation to rush your destiny because Satan would rather have you give a miscarriage of your future than to actually see you come into the fullness of what God has for you. And that's the very thing he's doing to Jesus, tempting him with identity, tempting him with authority, tempting him with things. Because ultimately, when Jesus dies upon the cross and is raised from the dead, all authority of heaven and earth were given to Jesus. And the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord. And Jesus is the ruler of every kingdom. And Jesus is the ruler of this earth. And he didn't rush his identity, but he responded with the word of God. But he's like, Satan, but if you will then worship me, it will all be yours. Now, I kind of like looked into this word worship here. I was curious as to what is the picture of this worship? Is it just like, oh, mighty Satan? Actually, it's the same word as a dog which comes to its master licking nonstop. <laughs> Do you like those dogs? You know, who, who likes those? There's, there's dog people in here, I know. It's like some people, oh, they like shy. You know, I, I go to people's houses all the time, and then sometimes the dog and like licking, trying to lick your face. I'm like, I don't know where this tongue has been, or if I do, maybe I've. But that's what Satan is asking Jesus to do. Just be like a dog and lick my hand that I'm your true master. And we need to realize it doesn't matter with the seduction of words or the seduction of the temptation. Satan's job is to make you like a dog and he the master where you're licking his hand thinking that the goodness of your life comes from him. But he's the father of death. He's the father of thieves. He's the father of lies. Our God is the father of light. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Everything that you have comes from God. And that's what Jesus was standing up. And he came and said, you shall worship the Lord your God. You shall honor, bow down, reverently exalt and lift up he who was, he who is, and he who's to come, the one who was from the beginning, the one who will be at the end, your creator and your master. This is the God we worship, and he is the only God that is worthy to be worshiped. He's the only God worthy to be exalted. He's the only God worth being and laying down your life for, and it is his words that we live upon. It is his identity Entity that we live upon. It is by his provision that we live and breathe and move. Amen? And then Satan took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from there, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, let you strike your foot against a stone. Now, what's fascinating about this particular thing is I can actually take you to Jerusalem and you can touch the actual stone that Satan took Jesus to. Real. Like we know exactly where the real thing is. 
you know, a lot of things in Israel, you're not quite sure. It's like there's a church and they say something happened, but you're like, how can I know that this is the real pinnacle of the actual temple that Jesus' feet touched when Satan brought him there? And it's because there's literally a sign that was engraved that said that this is the place of the blowing of the trumpet, which was the pinnacle of the temple. To give you an idea of how high this was, um, it would have been probably about 150 meters in the air. At least 150 meters in the air. And it was a place that was where they announced the start of the Sabbath every week. And it's where they blew the trumpets to start the new moon of the new month of every month. And it was the place of the blowing of the trumpet for the feast of trumpets to declare the coming of the king and the Messiah. It was the place where they blew the trumpet and sounded the jubilee horn to set the people free. And it's this important place that Satan is coming to defile with Jesus. Again, to get you to question God. You know, can you just jump off the building and see if God's going to catch you? Uh, I don't think we want to do that. And Satan will do that. He will try to get you to violate your trust in God by trying to get you to, do God, to get God to do something that goes against his character or his nature. Satan will try to put mistrust, lack of faith, doubt into your being. But this is the thing. No matter what Satan comes against you with, he's a liar. If he comes up and says, your name's Christine. No, it's not. Because he's a liar. His motivation is a lie. His motivation is a twist. See, he tries to come to you with something that you would agree with so that you would come into agreement with him. And when we come into agreement with Satan, then we're not in agreement or alignment with God. You never, ever agree with Satan. Never. If Satan comes and says, the sky is blue, no, it's not. And if the very next breath, Holy Spirit shows up and goes, look at this blue sky. Wow, it's a blue sky. Because the heart of God can only be truth. And the heart of Satan can only be lie. When the Holy Spirit comes and convicts you of a sin, when the Holy Spirit comes and exposes something in your heart, you can agree with him because you know he wants you to be healed. He wants you to be empowered. He wants you to be able to repent. He wants you to be a witness. He wants you to be filled with his goodness. But when Satan comes and tries to reveal, he wants you to be condemned. He wants you to be humiliated. He wants you to be torn down in some way. He wants you to doubt God. He wants you to doubt yourself. And Jesus answered him and said, It is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now think about the power of that. Jesus is declaring with all authority, I know who my God is. I know who my king is. I know where my authority comes from. I know who is the one who empowers me, and it is not you. You are the accuser, the liar, the adversary, and nothing you say has any power or weight in me because I know who I am. I'm anointed by God, called by God, filled by God, sent by God, and it is by his word and his deeds and his actions that I live and move and have my being. It is in him that I am found, for he knew me before the foundations of this earth were laid. While I was still in my mother's womb, he knitted to me together. He has plans of a future for me, not to harm me and not for evil, but for peace and to prosper. He has called me his beloved. He has called me his friend, for we are not just simple servants of God, for a servant does not know the Father's mind, but Jesus reveals the mind of the Father and has called you friend. And Satan has no access to that any longer. And when the devil had ended every temptation, 
he departed him until an opportune time. This is the authority from James and Peter and Paul when they begin to tell us to resist the enemy, to put on the armor of Christ, to put on the mind of God, that we have authority not because of who we are, but because of who Jesus is. When Jesus defeated Satan at this moment, Satan could never tempt Jesus again. Satan himself could never come. It was always through someone else. It was through somebody else who had aligned themselves to Satan that then tried to attack who Jesus was. And it was from the place of great humility, the place of hunger, the place of the desert, the place of remembering that it was God who set Israel out of Egypt, and it was God who gave us his Torah, his words, his commandments. It was God who led us safely through the waters into the promised land. It is God himself who will do these things that now Jesus would be raised up with a still small voice with the power of the out loud word of God, with the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the word, and Satan is defeated and conquered, that Jesus would come into authority to do what no other king or prophet or messenger or person has ever done on this earth. He never sinned. Retaining the full authority of being a direct descendant of Adam, and relying in complete submission to his Father in heaven. And it is through Jesus that we enter that as well. I don't have to be strong enough because it's Jesus who is. I don't have to overcome because it's Jesus who overcame. And it is in him that we need to grab a hold of because Jesus defeated every single temptation that is on this earth. Jesus defeated every single one. So in that way, when I show that I'm a stupid sheep and I forget and I fall in temptation, I can return to the throne of grace and I can grab a hold of that truth of Jesus yet again. And it is through him that I can say, Satan, be gone. And he has to leave. He has to flee. Now your temptations of your brain and your body and your habits, that's up to you. That's also why Jesus says, confess your sin to one another that you might be made free, that we create a church and a community that will be strong, and we have life groups that will be strong, that we can support one another when our bodies are weak. Our spirits in Jesus are strong and overcomers, but our bodies must be transformed as well. So that way we don't fall to the temptations that Jesus has overcome. Amen? Good news? Good news? This is the good news. Satan has been defeated, and Jesus is victorious. The head of the serpent has been crushed, and we are connected to the King of Kings. Amen? So I ask the worship team to come forward. I really hope that you will keep going deeper into these gospel, into these stories. And I pray that just as we identified with Jesus being baptized, that you too would be today once again identify. And that just as Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit, that you again right now would open up your soul and your spirit to the Holy Spirit of God to come and to fill you up. It didn't say that Jesus was half filled and he went out. It says when Jesus was filled to the fullest, that he then went. And where he went, he didn't go to do. He went to the desert to be. He went to the desert to be the Son of God. He went to the desert to reaffirm who it is that gives him everything. 
He went to the desert to grab a hold of that destiny and that promise to say that God was faithful and true, that God is faithful and true. Therefore, God will always be faithful and true. And no matter what kind of wilderness you're in, for Seoul is a wilderness, Korea is a wilderness, but we do not have to be dominated by the wilderness, for in the wilderness there is one God, and it's Jesus Christ, our living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I pray that the Holy Spirit would give you this fresh revelation. I pray that you would begin to know again your identity. You would know the word of God, for it says the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance the testimony of Jesus. So at the day of your next temptation, when Satan comes to attack who you are, your identity or the goodness of God or the promise of God, when he tries to tempt you to go ahead of God, or then he tries to tempt you to begin to uh, twist the character and nature of God, that you would be able to stand up by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you just have to simply say, I belong to Jesus. Go take it up with him. You don't need to scream. You just need to confidently tell Satan, go to the foot of the cross. Go to the place of resurrection and take it up with Jesus. Wait, you can't? Bye bye So I just want to ask if you just put your hand on your hearts. And just ask right now for Holy Spirit to fill you again. And if your battle has been in your mind, put your hand on your head and just remind yourself and declare, be full of the Holy Spirit. And that my mind bows only to Jesus. And if it's your actions that you're struggling with, that you would lift up your hands before God and say, it is by the blood of Jesus that you have cleansed the work of my hands. And these hands should only worship Jesus. For I was not made to be a dog to lick the hand of a master. I was made in the likeness of God with the breath of his spirit which has filled me, that I am valuable and worthy because Jesus paid the price for me and set my worth and set my value. And I declare over your lives in the name and the power of Jesus that Satan would not be able to come as a deceiver or an angel of light, that he would be revealed and that God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would reveal any trick or temptation or test that, he has, that Satan is lined up for you, that you would see him coming, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would overcome. And I declare you to be new creations and new creatures. I declare you the children of God.